try to unmute. I decided I'm not waiting for the whole thing for that to finish because we got started a little late. I was talking to my guest in the in the uh, in the green room prior to going live here, and I looked up what time it was. I was like, "Oh man, we should be like live right now!" And so go ahead and kicked it off. Um, welcome, you guys, to uh, Cyber Social Hub's Hubcast. My name's Kevin Along. I'm the founder of Cyber Social Hub. If you are not a member of Cyber Social Hub, I'm going to give you that opportunity here in just a minute. Um, and if you didn't notice, we are actually in a, uh, a new platform. Well, if you're watching on YouTube or <clears throat> Twitter X, whatever, you don't even notice uh, some of the differences, except maybe some of the graphics are a little different. But we're in a full back end. So uh, if you watched last week, I kind of screwed that up pretty good um, with just the way the scenes transitioned and whatnot. Again, average person wouldn't notice, but uh, finicky me notices these types of things. So if you got a second, uh, make sure you guys say hi in the chat. I'm gonna, uh, we can bring live chat up onto the screen, which I'll do so here in just a little bit. But first and foremost, I got to flip over here and talk to you about our sponsor who is bringing you this today. It is uh, Virtual Forensic Computing. Now, we've had these guys on the Hubcast before. I think they've done some, uh, some webinars. If you remember, uh, I think it was Tom played the ukulele on the Hubcast. So. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, but if you've ever wondered uh, about virtual machines and how to utilize them in your forensic investigation, they have an online course now that you guys can, can take if you're interested in it. Um, it's going to provide you all that training that you're going to need to really identify and focus on um, the relevant digital evidence from uh, your the computer system that you're you're taking a peek at. Um, you're going to look and learn how to basically create, configure the in virtual environment, because that's probably the, one of the most challenging things or what I had, I personally had struggles with was that there. Um, and then it's going to take a look into some different operating systems, Windows, Linux, how you can virtualize these without altering the data. Obviously, that's one of the most important things, right? We don't want to change data. So you can learn how to streamline that investigation and it's going to save you a lot of time. Say maybe that's not the machine you're looking for or that evidence or information is just kind of jumping right out at you. Um, you're going to be able to do it um, in a in the digital crime scene just in seconds. I mean, it's going to be quick for you. So um, if you get a chance um, and you're more interested in visit uh, bfc.uk.com. Um, it's uh, right there. You can scan that too. But uh Visit, it's called uh, vfc.uk.com slash training, forward slash training, uh, and enroll today. Or you can use that QR code there. Uh, just take your smartphone out, hit it, and it'll drive you right to that um, that page. So with that um, being said, I want to tell you a little bit about um, Cyber Social Hub. If you're not familiar with Cyber Social Hub, um, you should be because you're you're hanging out here on the, on the channel. and uh, we give you free memberships. It's free, 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 free. Everything we do, we try to keep free. Um, obviously, it's, it's sometimes challenging, but thank goodness to all the sponsors on the channel, like uh, like BFC and uh, and my guests coming up, that uh, help keep everything free for you guys. So you can uh, we can give you the latest and greatest stuff. Um, so what Cyber Social Hub is again, just a community of digital investigators. You can go in there uh, if you got a question ask a question. Somebody hopefully will get in there and answer it. If not, I'll personally try to find the answer for you, or at least somebody that can answer it and, uh, and uh, make sure you get your problem solved out there. So awesome. 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 Uh, join up if you haven't yet. So what I'm going to do is, Hey, there we go. Pop up some, uh, some chat there on the screen. So we're in, uh, we're in restream right now and I'm kind of testing out some different platforms. We are with Ecamm. Um, and I was having some bandwidth issues here at the, at the house. And uh, so Ecamm was causing me a little grief. So it caused me to reach out and to look for other sources. Restream a little bit better um, because how, how the old system works, so you guys knew, is everyone would connect to me here. And then I would then broadcast out to all of the social networks, right? Obviously, that takes a lot of bandwidth to do when you're doing it from a single point. Uh, that's how Ecamm was functioning. And, um, well, obviously when I have bad internet days or obviously the kids are home from school, they're streaming the internet like insane. So we need to find a better solution. Restream is what we're using now. That way everybody dials into Restream and then Restream just pushes it out to all the networks that you guys are seeing. Cause we're broadcasting out to, uh, hang on. I can see the whole list right now. Yeah. 
YouTube, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, X, and it says plus one. I don't know. I can't see the other one. It's hidden, but there's one other that we're pushing out to. I just don't know what it is off the top of my head, but we can bring chat up onto the screen and a little, make it a little bit more interactive. So, hey, Bob and hey, Megan, I can see you guys are, uh, are also here as well. So well, without further ado, I'm going to switch this over. Um, and again, if you watched last week's episode, you'll know that I really am a little uncomfortable with these buttons. Uh, so I'm going to do my darndest here to bring uh, our guest up right now. Um, and it is Matt Danner. And ooh, hey, I did it. Yay. <laughs> From Monolith Forensics. Hey, Matt, how are you? Hey, good. Good. Doing well. Good. Excellent. So I can even individually adjust volumes on here between the multiple users. I'm really happy. It's awesome. Now, you should be able to see the the chat too, right? You have a chat button. You have a private chat down at the bottom somewhere. And that's yep. just me. If we want to chat. Yeah. And I see there's a chat window on the right. Here. Yeah. So if you click that one, um, you'll be able to see, you know, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, all the chats that happen out in there too. Honestly, I mean, I, I guess dude, does this aggregate all the messages from those different platforms? Does it yeah. Tell me? It aggregates them all. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's just, you, you could kind of see them on, we used to use, use Ecamm too. This makes it a little bit easier. And we can even uh, pop them up on the, the screen here. We'll bring Bob up here. There's Bob. Oh, nice. So you yeah. can bring him up and then hide him again like that. So, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool pretty cool little little platform uh, for cool. sure. Makes it, it make, It's easy because it's all web-based. That means um, like Ecamm's Mac only, and it's software you have to download, uh, which means my team can't get in and help me set it up if I'm busy doing something else. This one allows teams to come in and set everything up uh and then i just show up and talk um but at least until i decide what i'm gonna do i'm anyway i'm so sold on ecamm i still love it i just it doesn't this doesn't do the things that ecamm can yeah i'm not a, i'm not a streamer so i don't i don't know what the <laughs> i don't know what the tech is or the the current state of things are so yeah it's it's easy i like that's why i like it because it's easy. Um, Makes it simple. But anyway, we have a check-in that we're supposed to be doing, right? Because we're midway, a little bit mid past midway through the year. And we did a show, I think it was the very first one in January that we did this year, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. And we did a basically a predictions show of what we saw coming in digital investigations, right? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we're trying to hold ourselves accountable here. We're going to do a mid and then we'll do an end um, as well. But we're going to check in with some of the um, mid stuff and see how we predicted. So what I'm looking at now is I'm trying to pull up and uh, some of the show notes from uh, last year and uh, and see what we managed to do here. Um, hang on one second. I'm trying to pull all this stuff up. So it's really just a check-in, and I'm kind of curious of what, if anyone else had any predictions as well. We'll, we'll open that up here in, uh, in just a minute as I'm digging through this mess. All right, I got to get off of this screen. I'm trying to learn how to uh, do all this stuff, and it's not working out real well for me. There we go. All right. Um, there are some show notes here, and I'll help you out with uh, with some of the show notes. I'll I'll go for well. We had one that was the same, um, and it was kind of the the glaring one, the the big one out there, which was, um, of course, I think people have been talking about for a long time was AI, right? Yeah, I think we had the same prediction, but I think mine was a little bit more. Uh, uh, mine mine was a little bit more uh, cynical than yours. <laughs> Like, uh, people will claim will claim to have AI in their forensic tools. That's right. It was. It was. Now that you mentioned it, I tried to watch the show this morning a little bit. To, I, I honestly didn't remember anything that I said. I remember that one very well because, like, I just knew. I mean, you, I already saw it happening with companies that aren't in the forensic space. You know, because of the, <clears throat> it's it's not as quite as uh, bad now, but at the time, it was just kind of. In the uh, the software space and the sort of venture capital space, 
that's all that anybody cared about or wanted to talk about was was what are you doing with AI? What what's yeah. your problem doing with AI? And it's like it doesn't matter if you just I don't know generate random strings or random numbers. You, you know, companies just need to say they have AI. So right. Um, and there's you know a little bit of a I think it's better now. I think people better understand this type of AI that we have now. But at the time, people didn't understand that. You know, these are these are natural language processing models. These aren't, you know, these aren't little Einsteins in a box. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's a specific type of AI that's good at natural language processing, which has a lot of really good applications, but also means there's some limitations to it, to where it's not an all-around general artificial intelligence system. Right. Um, so, because of that misunderstanding, first half of the year, it's sort of like everybody has to like claim they have it just, just from marketing and, and sort of branding purposes. Yep. Um, yeah, I think you hit it on the head with that. It's, I say, I even hate to use, I, I, I am, I think I'm a little more cynical just from, uh, our conversation last time because it's not even AI really. Well, we have to accept that the definition has changed. So I, AI I, is now the colloquial name for anything that's sort of, um, you know, any any process or engine that's capable of, you know, conducting more complicated tasks without specific instruction sets, I guess is a good way to think about it. So you can just use any any system where you can tell something, tell it to do something in English, and then it can execute that task. Yeah, is what we're classifying as AI now. That's why now you have the term of AGI is now becoming the new version of what we used to think AI was, which is artificial general intelligence. Ah, gosh, I had not heard that term before. Yeah, so AGI, AGI, is, AGI, artificial general intelligence. So that now refers to data from Star Trek, right? <laughs> right, gotcha. So it used to be AI was just AI meant data from Star Trek. Now AI means large language models, which is natural language processing. AGI is now what they've coined the term for something closer like to data from Star Trek. Um, also, there's also artificial super intelligence. I've heard that being tossed around recently as well. Oh my gosh. Yeah, artificial super intelligence is also another term because they're trying to rebrand so that people understand there's a difference between what chat GPT is doing and what data from Star Trek is doing. Right. Right. I, yeah. I heard a, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so because AI has just become a marketing term now that everybody's colloquially colloquially using to describe these systems. Um, so they're they're trying to make sure people understand there's a difference between that and the AI, the Terminators from you know from Terminator One and Two or whatever, or Skynet, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who who was it that said? Uh... I can't remember. I was watching and, and somebody in the audience I'm sure will know, or you might even know is I was sitting and kind of, uh, flipping through, uh, what would they call it? Doom scrolling basically through social social. Um, and I had, I was searching for AI stuff specifically and I can't remember who said it, but they said something about AI is definitely not AI. Um, you know, if you tell AI to write a, um, you know, a Western movie or a script, right? It's going to be able to do that, right? You say, hey, you can use five different characters, tell a little bit about each character, and then it will go off and, and write it. But they said, by no means is this any type of intelligence. What it does is go reads every, it's just fast, right? And has access to a large data set of what we call the internet. It can <laughs> and compare all it's, of the references to this and then build a script based off of everyone else's work. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's, a, it's a little bit, uh, yeah, just to, and I don't, I don't want to go too in the deep, in the weeds. I don't claim to be an AI expert, but I am, I, yeah. I'm a digital forensics expert. I am an engineer. So I do understand some of this, but, um, it does what you're saying, but there's another layer to it though, which is what chat should be, what these LLMs are doing. It's using predictive analysis to produce an output. So when you give it a prompt, you give it like you give it that prompt of write a script about a Western movie. Mm -hmm. Doing is this taking that language, putting it through a prediction model, a sort of decoder, and predicting what the the most likely output from that data is. 
Hmm. So what it can do, and it's hard for us to understand as human beings because it's basing that prediction model. It's basing that those predictions off of a model that has trillions of bits of data in it, right? So it has this model with all of this data, and it's using all of that data to define a prediction, a probability distribution on what you've just prompted it. So if you ask it, hey, write a script, write a script that's about some kind of Western movie. Well, it has all of this base of English language to base its predictions on, and it just takes each of those words and phrases and spits out what it thinks the most likely um, distribution of words is related to what you just gave it. And that ends up being, and that's part of these, when you see GPT one, two, three, four coming out, what they're doing is they're just creating bigger and more fine-tuned models that get better and better at those predictions. Hmm. So it, that's effectively what it's doing. It's just basically a giant probability distribution that's running on a lot of really expensive hardware that's pre-trained to understand what those probabilities are and then it's outputting a result. So a way that I try to tell people about the difference between like LLMs and artificial intelligence is you're thinking as a human, when you play around with ChatGPT, you're thinking about whether it's sentient or not. ChatGPT is not thinking about whether you are sentient or not, right? <laughs> There's good. no that's thinking great. there that's happening, right? That's when, to me, that's when we cross into the boundary of we have now true artificial intelligence where the AI you're talking to is also thinking about what you're thinking, right? Because because now it's like, there's some other thing going on in the background that you're not seeing because it's doing its own thinking and processing just by interacting with you. Whereas with these systems, they're not doing that. They're just, you're just giving them an input and they're spitting out an output that's based on some set of parameters that we've designed, whether it be probability distributions, models, these AI models or, or something else, or even if it's just a simple Python script that we write. Right? We yeah. write yeah. scripts. For that Python script to work, I have to give it some kind of input, and then it returns some kind of output. There is no thinking process involved before or after that that process or that exchange. Nope, nope, spot on, spot on. Um, hang on a second, I got Amber throwing some stuff in. So AI is being actually banned from forensic tools in certain countries. I was not aware of that. That's uh. It's an interesting fact. <laughs> if that's true, I mean, is that like banned from like, like the tool cannot be engineered to have artificial intelligence? Uh, I'm not sure. So we'll have to do the whole 15 second wait because we're living in the future about 15 seconds. That, that's uh, uh, I'm I say, that's sure. If that's the case, if they're just banning the tech from being used in forensic tools at all, I think that's pretty short sighted. Yeah. Uh, because the purpose of an AI tool in something like forensics is not to generate conclusions for you, but it's just to help you go through data, right? It's just to help you sift through a billion points of data that you're looking at. So for example, you know, you could theoretically see a future where you pass in, let's say you have a Windows computer. We know from, from forensics, there's just certain things we care about when we're doing forensic analysis of a Windows system. Mm -hmm. Theoretically feed that those choose the forensic artifacts we want, you know, process them in a certain way that it can be fed to an AI, and then we can essentially chat with those forensic artifacts through the AI and say, hey, do you see any evidence? Do you see any instances of USB devices being used? And within seconds, the, the, the AI could theoretically give you an answer, say, yeah, I see the following instances. And if you set it up right, you can even set it up to where it gives you an answer and then gives you the references so that you can actually, it can tell you yeah, I see three instances of USB device being used. Here are the locations where I found that. And you click, you know, click into the locations and actually examine it yourself. So there's things like that that you could, where AI can be a very useful application in forensics at some, at some point. But, you know, yeah, the, this idea that you're going to walk into court with a report generated by an AI that, that you're then just regurgitating. I mean, I would argue that a lot of examiners are doing that anyway. <laughs> right. It's using Magnet and Celebrite and other tools where they <clears throat> look at the data themselves, they just generate a report and walk in court with it. So if we're banning AI tools, AI in tools like this, I mean, I think we should ban examiners from walking into court and just regurgitating a, a forensic report also. I mean, it's the same thing. There's not really a difference there. So it's all no, about- I actually agree very much with that. We've, we've gone off on long tangents, I think, on that, on that yeah. very subject before. Um, 
whether it's been on a hubcast or not, I don't know, but yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I mean, um, it's all about, I mean, so in a weird way, I could argue where I agree not having the AI tools because then it's just going to breed a new generation of people not, not doing their work anymore, not doing the forensic work. But at the same time, I'm also like someone like me, I could, I could see a lot of really useful applications for having AI based assistance in, in work looking at forensic data. Um, which is what a lot of com- you know a lot of companies that's what they're trying to build AI mm-hmm. models to do. They're not using it in a forensic context, but they're using it in other contexts that are similar, right? Like, how do you look at business intelligence? How do you, you know, can we use AI models to help us understand customer model better, or customer attitudes, or impressions, or or can we use it to look at our business data and, and see if there's gaps in our revenue or gaps in our sales process? You know, things like that that we're going to use AI to assist us. Is that AI can look at that data and churn it a lot faster than we can as, as a data analyst or financial advisor or whatever. Yeah, no, for sure. Spot on. Um, and I just realized, Matt, I, I just didn't introduce you at all. I we just went right oh, in did. to the, I think you did. That I, well, I said a monolith, right? Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, I guess um, what I wanted to let people know is what, what your company does a little bit before, sure. uh, before we get too deep yeah, into so, it. now we're 20 yeah. minutes in. <laughs> I'm the owner and founder of, of Monolith Forensics. Uh, what we do is, is we build software that's sort of like, um, it's, you know, the traditional term for it would be case management for digital forensics, but I try not to use that phrase too much because um, what we're really working on is, you know, case management is, is basically, you know, a lot of case management can theoretically be done in a spreadsheet, uh, which is what most people tend to use. So we, we try to, do things that a spreadsheet can't do. You know, we add dimensions to what you're doing in the forensic lab in terms of how you're tracking things, how you're collaborating with team, you know, your, your colleagues, giving you a place to take your notes, you know, giving you a place to, if you do a good job and put data into Monolith, you have the reward of spitting out a nice case report that has everything in it for you. Um, so we're really working on a, a productivity tool or an operating system for the forensic lab for both, you know, Traditional forensic teams for e-discovery teams and also for incident response teams in different cybersecurity contexts. So um, that's where, and I'm the currently the lead engineer. We have a couple of engineers on staff, and I, I kind of lead that team. So that's where, if you're curious, where where you know, if you're asking yourself, where does this guy get off talking about AI? It's because well, that's that's because that's eighty percent of my job is, is engineering our platform and looking at these different technologies and systems to see how they can be useful to, to us as a, as a software company. Yeah. That's why I, I kind of want to give some context. Uh, find that it's like, Matt kind of knows what he's talking about. Kevin, you don't listen to me at all. Cause I'm just like, I speculate and I, I just stir the pot. That's my sole role in life is <laughs> to stir the pot, be, get people fired up. Um, if you want to learn Matt, more about mass company, it's over there somewhere. Uh, the QR code. <laughs> Uh, I, th- I think it's going to take you to his website and not some nefarious site. You can trust us perfectly fine. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I, I wanted to make sure that um, I was bringing that up in there and uh, I'm looking at chat to see if anything else was, uh, was coming in there. Oh, um, Paraben says it's probably Amber. I'm guessing it's Amber probably behind the, the Paraben thing. Well, she, brings up, uh, she brings up another good point. Um, cause she's mentioning it's probably related to privacy issues, which makes a lot of sense because right now the only effective way to use AI right now is through third party, you know, companies like open AI or mm. Microsoft or, right. um, you know, Facebook and meta. And that presents, you know, especially for us in our realm, that presents a real challenge for us if we're in law enforcement or government, or even, even if you're a cybersecurity company or whatever, you're dealing with client data and it's not clear to you whether you should use these third-party AI systems um, to, to help in your in your process. So what's interesting about that is it kind of ties into one of the other you know, claims that I made at the beginning of the year, which was we're going to see an increase in you know, more open source tooling. And well, I do think that's somewhat true to forensics. If you look at the AI landscape right now, just yesterday, Facebook released um, uh, released Llama 3.1 which is uh, a really impressive open source project where mm. if you're not familiar with Llama 3, Llama 3 is Facebook's AI model that they fully open sourced. So they have Meta AI, which is their cloud competitor to ChatGPT. But the models that Meta AI is based on have, have been open sourced by Facebook. Mm. So you can actually download and run these models locally if you want. 
the downside though is that things like Llama three point and three point one is just a is just the next iteration of it where the models are just more finely tuned and better. But they released a uh, four hundred and three billion parameter version of Llama three. So to give you context, the previous Llama three model had seventy billion parameters. So the basically the parameter size is a is a sort of um, description of the the model space, like how many how many pieces of information is is this model trained on and and can and can can use to to generate um, responses to natural mm -hmm. processing requests. And the fun part about that is that it's open source, but really you need to properly run that four hundred three billion um, parameter model. You probably need like a fifty thousand dollar server rig to properly run it um, because it requires. <laughs> the way these models work is those parameters have to be loaded in memory in order to get any kind of response at any decent rate. Really? So, yeah. So if I'm running that lot, that that model locally, and I ask it a request like I asked ChatGPT, if I want to get a request back that's sort of simultaneous, that's has a latency of a second or two, I need to run that model in in a fast operating space, which is basically memory. So in order to run something like that 403 billion parameter version of Llama, you need something like a terabyte of RAM and then something like 800 gigabytes of virtual memory, which would be running on GPUs. So you need like a significantly, um, an extremely powerful server or, or workstation to run it. It would probably have multiple, you know, linked GPUs that can handle the processing tasks required for Llama to effectively utilize the, the parameters in that model. Um, but having said that, they have a version that's that's an eight billion parameter model that can run on your laptop pretty easily. Wow, but it's a lot less accurate because it doesn't have it's not trained as on as much data. Right. But the point is, though, this is like I think this is where the future of open source and artificial intelligence is going. Is that uh, before long, probably within a year, you'll have fairly small and efficient models that'll be incredibly good at natural language processing tasks. Um, that can just run on, on a standard laptop or even on your phone. So what that's going to lead to is lots of open source projects that leverage these L, these more efficient LLMs that can just do a whole bunch of crazy stuff. Um, and if you're smart, you know how to utilize these models, you can build some really cool stuff. So imagine, for example, you could build, <laughs> if you do a lot of um, smartphone processing, and let's say you're working in law enforcement um, and you get a case from a detective that's on a homicide case or whatever, or maybe a narcotics case or whatever. And the detective's like, hey, I want to know, um, I want to see all messages related to guns, drugs, or assault of some kind. You can process that text message data and, and place in through, create something that's called an embedding, where you use a large language model to create embeddings for the text message data store it in something else called a vector database, and then write a fairly simple tool that uses an LLM to allow you to effectively chat with the text messages on the phone. So when you process it, you can then ask the LLM, hey, are there, can you, do you see any messages related to gun violence or guns? And what it can do is effectively run what we call a semantic search, meaning it doesn't do a keyword search, it doesn't search for the word gun. It's smart enough to understand, even if you don't use the word gun, but you're talking about guns mm -hmm. you use like you know you're, you're you use something like the word glock or you use something like rifle or you're just talking about shooting someone um <laughs> the language model is smart enough to understand those the colloquialism and the phrase has been used and it can show you yeah i found i found 16 instance instances where these chat messages contain conversations related to guns and um, I've seen sort of the, the way that these, this sort of application can be set up and it's really simple and it's going to get even easier as these models get more efficient and become smaller. These are going to be incredibly easy applications to build. Um, that's the sort of thing I kind of expect for these forensic tools to eventually have, but maybe with what Amber's saying, if it's not, if it's not allowed, then that could, that could put a hamper on things that could. You know, let's say the the European Union puts a ban on it, that that would you know potentially chill Magnet or Celebrite or some of those companies from putting it in, or maybe they find a way to feature flag it, make it sure it's only available in the states, not available to the EU or something. Sure. Um, but 
you won't have to rely on those companies. I mean, we could internally build that as a free tool if we wanted to, if we had the time and resources. It's not that crazy difficult. There's tons of open source developers in the forensic community that could build that as well. So it's it's oh, not yeah. crazy. It's not it's not as crazy as a thing as it sounds to just build it independently. A ton. And Mohammed is asking about leveraging AI for enhance. I think it was a, a response to yeah what Amber's question was originally. Um, you know, I my my thoughts on it, and you know, again, we're we're kind of revisiting our, our original predictions from back in January. But this is a, a great thing. Is that's that's really how I see, I personally see AI as being utilized is to help kind of narrow down. It's like, hey, you asked for to find pieces of evidence related to this or evidence related to this. Try looking at these things first, and then it's going to help you quickly identify potential. But then it's up to you as the examiner. Okay, now let's do the investigation. It identified what I'm looking for. Now I need to do the how did it get there? When did it get there? Put a body at the keyboard type of things. I don't, Mohammed, what you're asking, I personally don't see anything wrong with that in a, in a tool. But again, we're relying on governments and whatever someone tells the government official <laughs> as to what AI is bad. Right, that they may go. Oh, yeah, it could do this. It could. We don't want that. I mean, again, uh, you, you kind of got to refer back to the individual uh, country on it and uh, and how it got there in the first place. I'm going to spring chat up on the screen because there's a couple of them here. Let me pull these up. There we go. And that's you know that's generally the problem with new tech. Um, you know, especially new transform transformational tech that. You know, something like these large language models, it's such a huge leap in what people what people were accustomed to seeing from AI, right? We effectively in one year went from, I would even argue within one month, we went from AI as a fantasy to people on the street now see what they think is like Skynet operating on the internet, right? <laughs> so when things like that happen, it, you know, you just have this natural human response of fear, fear of the unknown. And people understand don't understand how these things work, so they immediately jump to, um, you know, we have to. I mean, think about how many in the first few months when ChatGPT came out. Think about how many people, what I would consider to be grifters, you know, came out and were like, "This is going to be. This is the end. You know, this is the end of the world. We're, we're about to like witness, you know, the singularity and and <laughs> this humanity's done with, right? And those those people were literally just. This happens every time something like this. There's people that come out of the woodwork to profit off the fear that people have when clearly that hasn't happened. These these large language models just aren't capable of the the sort of Skynet level stuff that people were worried about. But unfortunately, you know, for for the way humans work, you know, it's just it's just hard to overcome that level of fear. And there has to be anytime quick quick advances like this happen, that's what you're going to see is that it just takes time for people to adjust and get used to having this type of technology around and realizing that, okay, this isn't as bad as we thought it was. Ideally, our government officials will be smart enough to be able to understand that and, and make good decisions about it. But a lot of times they're not, especially considering here in the States, most of our government are populated like 70 year old plus people that don't know how technology works in the first place. Mm. Um, so, so that can cause custom issues, but. And they're all on Facebook posting memes. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, but yeah, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like I said earlier, the way to look at AI in relation to forensics is it's no different than all the other tools that we're using, right? If, if you're just doing your analysis and fully dependent on the forensic tool that you're using and you're not doing any kind of validation of your conclusions or findings, if you're not capable of manually investigating um, a forensic artifact that you found that a tool is reported to you, then you're not really doing forensics anyway. You're just, you're not doing the forensics. The engineers at whatever your software vendor is are doing the forensics. You're, you're just relying and hoping the engineers did their jobs correctly, um, which we've seen multiple cases in real life where that's been a disaster. So, yeah. um, and there's no difference with AI. You know, if you use AI in your forensic analysis, it doesn't matter if that's what you do. If you tell your forensic chat GPT, hey, do my analysis for me and write a report, and then you just walk into court with that report, then, then yeah. It's like, what do we need you for? We'll just put the AI in court and let it do its thing, right? So <laughs> that's, my, that's my perspective, at least. So. Yeah, I know my thoughts, too. Pretty, pretty spot on. I mean, obviously, you have a more in-depth understanding of it than I do, but um, we look back at the original predi uh, prediction of 
more AI, um, of course you were the cynical side of it, is that um, I, I think I've failed so far. I don't think it's it's where I thought it would be by now, or at least companies haven't released as much. I mean, there's some out there, don't get me wrong. There's some companies out there attempting to do it. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, something a little bit more, wham, what's that? What's that crazy show that uh, Tom Cruise, Cruise was in where it could predict? Minority Report. Yes, Minority Report, where, you know, something at least, maybe not predict like someone's behaviors, but I mean, crime and ache, if it, I wonder if it's possible, again, I'm going off a side tangent here to, you know, train a model of, of AI based on an individual's data set itself to predict certain behaviors that may or may not occur. Well, if you think about it, if you think about how I just explained something like chat GPT works, that's why it just popped. What's, in my scary, what's really scary about it, not from a destructive point of view, but from just <clears throat> thinking about it as existentially as a human being, all we, all we did with chat GPT is we just fed it a bunch of English. We just gave it a bunch of stuff that we say, mm-hmm. and it was able to create a probability model to so say you can give it any other word and it can guess what the response is supposed to be. So think about what that says about our language and our capable capabilities of communicating with each other. It means the things that we say to each other are predictable, right? So what does that mean? That means that if you had a large enough model, a large enough compute resources, a large enough, you know, the capacity and comp- computationally to process information, you could collect data from a person's life. Mm-hmm. Or you collect data from thousands or hundreds or millions of people, put it into a giant model like this, process all of it, and then suddenly you have a chat GPT model that can predict the future of any particular person, right? You can say, Ooh. what is this, this? Here's a person that does the following things on a regular basis. What is what are they going to do tomorrow? And then the chat this chat GPT thing, precog from minority report can look at the time of year, look at events that are happening now look at where does the person live um you know what are the demographics of the person and they could pro- probably accurately predict almost everything they're going to do tomorrow right as a human being and maybe even predict even further than that that would be I'm, interesting i'm kind of talking out of my my rear end about this but i'm just saying i like it actually if you had a computational system that's capable of processing trillions upon trillions upon trillions of data points to generate a predictive model of human behavior yeah, you might actually be able to create a chat GPT version that can you can just tell it some things about a person and they can predict what the next year of their life is going to look like. Yeah. I mean, just imagine someone's like um, social feeds included into their, you know, the C's systems, be it uh, desktop, laptop, mobile, um, and then pull all the other physical you know, the stuff that's not typically online, like yeah. even though you can pull address, stuff like that. Um, you know, if they can determine, do they have a, the accounts, if they can go out and find accounts that they typically subscribe to, that's scary. And someone's yeah. probably, I'm sure the government has yeah. this model already. <laughs> well, to be honest, you probably, if you think it's it, the reason it's sort of an existential weird issue is because none of us are chaotic in our lives. Like we don't choose to do things randomly from one day to the next. Right. So what that means is that your life can be broken down into an algorithm that, that a thing like ChatGPT can just kind of basically predict what you're going to do right. for the next 30 days, right? Yeah. Um, no, that's fact. People are going to know I, I drink coffee every morning at a certain time and what order I put yeah. cream and then the sometimes flavored syrup. Yeah, and it's scary, the stuff that I do just out mm-hmm. of habit. We all we all like to think we're the the main character of our own stories, and we do all these unique, great, wonderful things. But really, you know, we we live in the same part of the world. We live in the same culture. We all pretty much do the same stuff every day. Yep, without a doubt. You know, it, it's it's sort of a weird kind of makes you think like maybe I should do more random stuff uh, from one day to the next just to <laughs> throw off the algorithms. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, for sure, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah so. I'm going to admit my own failure in the AI thing. I, I really thought there'd be some more developments in true AI. People are just throwing, they're using it as a marketing term. I think yeah. you're referring to than anything else. It's not, it's not true AI. It's what the tools have been doing forever and ever. They just slapped an AI label on it and maybe a different way of presenting it. Um, to it. It's not a true, true set. A true set is 
making what kind of what we were just talking about, I think, is making it the data set itself seized the model where yeah. it can actually learn from all of that data. Um, and then it'd be able to say, hey, this joker was doing this over here. What? what wait, what? <laughs> and you can go and find yeah. all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I mean, because I think AI can be a real, if if we use it right and we build it right, especially in a forensic context, it can be super useful because mm -hmm. it can just make it to where, as a human being, you're just looking through a bunch of raw data and you're capable of missing things, right? Whereas an AI, you know, it's it's trained on the data that you're trying to look at, right? So if, if you set it up properly, you can just ask it questions. You can literally, you know, chat. You can you can set up an AI where theoretically you can chat with a computer like it's a person. You know, feed it forensic data from a computer and talk to the computer like like you're talking with the dead, like you're a medium or something, right? To the computer instead of a dead person, and by doing that, you can say, hey, did you ever get, did anyone ever plug, like, where did, you know, where did the bad guy insert the USB drive? Like, have you, has anyone ever connected a thumb drive to you? Has anyone ever tried to upload data to the internet from you? Has anyone ever tried to delete data from you or whatever? And, and suddenly it can just talk to you and give you responses and say, yeah, there was this one user who deleted a bunch of stuff from me on January 12th. Like, cool. Show me where you're seeing that. Show me that, and then just <laughs> that now, my friend, is AI and how it should work. <laughs> not, not this. Like, hey, go, go do that, go do that. And well, isn't that cool though? Like, you could almost treat the computer like a witness. You know? Yeah, like, and just, I can see it now. <laughs> yeah. So I got some uh, man. Uh, you know, where is Alexis Bergoni when we need him? We could make some awesome memes out of that whole. You know, sitting the old beige laptop, setting up on the stand, testifying. Or the old beige box with the big CRT monitors. Yeah. Just, anyway. <laughs> yeah. So let me, let me look back at my uh, notes here too. Uh, so AI, obviously we've been talking about that one for a, a little while. Um, you talk, you mentioned the, the rise in open source. Where do you, where do you think that's at right now? You know, we're seven uh, months into the year. I think, I mean, I think it's about the same. I think with open source um, in forensics specifically, I think, I haven't seen a whole lot of new open source tools pop up, um, but I do hear, I, ge I mean, generally I hear more people talking about it and more people just generally trying to build their own tools. Um, mostly yeah. because they're, I mean, from my perspective, what I'm seeing is, and this is why I made this prediction, is because people are, they're feeling pressure from rising prices of forensic software. But more importantly, what we're seeing is, Forensic software is getting more expensive and the value isn't matching with the expense in a lot of cases, or at least those companies might claim they are. But from when you talk to customers, a lot of customers just aren't feeling the value that they're getting for the increased costs. So what you're just seeing is a natural pressure of people looking for alternatives. They're looking for other ways to do things. So that's going to go into a lot of different places. Sometimes it's, are there other tools out there we can buy? Sometimes it's, do we even need to do this process anymore? And sometimes it's the, usually the young nerdy guy that's trying to make their mark in the world or young, young woman who's like, you know what? I think I can build this myself. Yeah. And they do the research to, to actually build a tool where they just build something on their own that, that solves some problem they have that they don't have to spend thousands of dollars on anymore. You know, I think that's sort of the general trend that we're going to start seeing, especially considering just like in the programming world, nobody owns any of this data, right? So the data that you look on a hard drive, it's like nobody has, nobody can keep you from reverse engineering it or looking at it. So because of that, it makes it to where anybody with programming knowledge can, can write their own solutions or build their own solutions to some of these analytical problems in forensics. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, who in our community has the, you know, has the sort of fortitude and the the will to actually work on these problems and make them available to the rest of the community. Yeah, I'd be curious to see. Um, and I know I didn't ask this for the first one, and I didn't realize we could see uh, chats come in from from LinkedIn. This is the first time I've ever seen a chat pop in from LinkedIn on this system, uh, which is which is cool. Of course, um, it means you, you basically said, "Hey." <laughs> The video connection is not stable, but the chat works, man. Look at that. That's the very first 
LinkedIn chat I've ever seen come in on the show. So that's pretty cool. But people in the audience, um, first question would be to say, um, if you're using quote unquote, again, I'm using this very loosely of what a vendor has marketed to you, like an AI in, in your investigations, um, or what we're just talking about with open source tools. Um, I'd be, li- I'd be interested to see, you know, just a comments in there. You could just type like open source. Yes. Or AI. Yes. Into the chat. Um, I'd be curious to see if you guys are all using it or have used it or, you know, what, what a vendors kind of labeled as, as AI, um, into the chat. Give me, give us an idea of, uh, <clears throat> of whether that's going anywhere or not. I, I have a good idea that it, the chat's going to stay pretty stagnant <laughs> of where it's at at the moment, but I got to remember that we're 15 seconds into the future too. So they're just now hearing what I said. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, that would be interesting. Let me let me pop back uh, to the show notes while we wait for some of those things to come in. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned then, and this one is a colossal failure, unless I just haven't heard anything on it. I did a quick uh, search for this prior to the show earlier this morning. I was prepping for the show, and I mentioned some of the virtual gaming uh, not not VR to be clear, but um, if you remember I talked about GeForce Now, uh, which I still play uh, to this day. And then Am- Amazon, I think they still have Luna. I haven't checked to see if it's still around. I'm guessing it's still around. Um, where you know, obviously I'm on a Mac, right? If anyone ever has tried gaming on a Mac, God bless you, number one. Uh, and then you know, near it's impossible, right? Because everything's just written for for Windows. And or, or or PlayStation, right? Get a console, and uh, man, I like I like the layout of. I'm, I'm an old school PC gamer, and I like you know uh, to go and play like that with the mouse and everything else. PlayStation had something interesting a few years ago. Well, with PlayStation, oh crime, not more than a few years ago now. It's a PlayStation Three. It had controllers based off of people who are transitioning from PC to bring them over, uh, which was awesome. I loved it. But I just wanted to keep using those types of controllers. But anyway, the VR gaming, they're, they're virtual, right? Which means the game, the chat, nothing lives on my system because I'm streaming essentially the controls to my mouse and everything quickly back to, you know, GeForce's Now or Amazon's Luna, where, man, the, the lag time was so low, I didn't even notice it. Um, I just die a lot anytime, anyway, so it doesn't matter. I mean, I could be just getting killed. But any investigations into those types of uh, of machines where I'm logging into like a massive multiplayer online where it was traced back to where it was a GeForce Now machine spun up or a, L- a Luna machine spun up. Um, I haven't seen any of those. I really thought that there'd be more of that now, but I think people are just, <laughs> maybe I was just a, a few years too early with it um, because you know, the machines, and the reason I don't go buy some crazy, outrageous, expensive Windows machine, the graphics card are insane, is because you got to replace them every year, roughly, um, every few months. And with GeForce Now, I don't have to do that. Uh, you know, GeForce, NVIDIA does that for me. I don't have to mess. Um, yeah, I, think if they can, I think this is what I brought up the last time we talked about it, but if they can master the latency issue, and they can make it a, a seamless experience. Um, yeah, I think I think that makes sense because if if I could, I mean, I have a PlayStation Five. I don't do much PC gaming anymore, but um, just because, like you said, now nowadays I'm just like PCs are just too much of a hassle to build gaming PCs now. Um, if it was like a hobby, I'd do it, but sometimes I just you know I play once or twice a week. I don't really feel like dropping three grand on a perfect gaming rig just to replace it in a year. Um, you know. <laughs> but I think if they can master the latency and, and make it towards a seamless experience, I would definitely do that. I would take advantage of that for sure. Um, Cause the other problem is, is like, I feel like consoles, I mean, they just feel like such an outdated concept too, right? Like I'm going to go buy a gaming console, like in 2024 to plug into the RCA port on my computer, my CRT, you know, it just feels like it's a concept from the nineties, you know? Right. Um, and it just feels like it's due. It's just waiting for someone to disrupt that process. You know what I mean? Yeah. The way to disrupt it. 
Um, yeah, and it's 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 interesting. I, I think I'm just way too far ahead that there hasn't been much a, adoption of that. Yeah, but if you guys haven't checked it out and you're gamers, um, I highly just check it out. I mean, they have a free version of um, the GeForce Now to, to test it, and then I upgraded because the experience was really good. Um, and I have a Steam account, so it linked right to my Steam account, um, which allowed, uh, you know, obviously it's the games I purchased on Steam to be pushed up to um, GeForce Now. So, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's finding the data, right? Especially if you're, you know, especially when you're dealing with a groomer or predator type scenario in games, which is the, the typical type of crime you deal with there, or some type of fraud, then, um, you know, that none of that had to be uh had to be dealt with as of yet but it'll get there at some point i think they should just i'm surprised that tv manufacturers i mean i guess i do understand because it makes them more expensive but i mean it just seems like if i were a tv manufacturer i would be looking into standardizing some kind of um uh adding a, a functionality to my tv to where it has some sort of standardized gaming hardware right where it's like Hey, we're Sony, and this is our Sony line of televisions that have gaming hardware built into the television, where mm. through the smart TV interface, you just download mm. games like like it's like a piece like Steam or like, you know, the way Steam has it set up on PC, but you just do it through your TV and you just plug in, you buy a Xbox controller or PlayStation controller and just plug yeah. it in, sync it to your television, and you just, and it's just a seamless experience, and you get either the sort of streaming process that you're talking about or you just get the the same process you get in a console where you download a game and it runs locally but it uses internet to store and share data or whatever and and then suddenly you have this seamless experience where you just pay a couple hundred extra bucks for the television to have the gaming capability um, and then you introduce that to to game developers and you build sort of a universal gaming platform where it's easier for if you're a developer that you're making something for Xbox and PlayStation, then you can also make an additional build for the Sony gaming platform or the LG gaming platform or whatever. Um, yeah. Now, now on that, I know Roku, that's a great idea. Sony is going to take your idea and run with it. <laughs> they have PlayStation already. Hopefully they do. I'd fully support that. <laughs> They're absolutely going to. Why wouldn't they? The streaming platform, because they already have some streaming capabilities, but you know, we don't think they're not going to make any blockbuster movies anytime soon, because their 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 movies always suck. So they need a, <laughs> they need a different avenue to generate revenue, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I know I know Roku has um, like some smaller games. Like I think they they license a version of Pac Man to put on some of their TVs now, um, where it's it's essentially streaming a game of Pac Man. But you know, I, I would say the technology is there because what GeForce Now is doing, um, you know, the requirements for the actual computer aren't much, right? Yeah. Because I'm streaming everything. Everything's ta- ha- happening off my deck. Why couldn't they do a TV? Uh, and right. that, that's what I put a, an interesting twist on investigations. I think the problem comes down with the, the only problem with the streaming with gaming. It, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily affect all games, but you do have that a little bit of a latency issue. Yeah. Where- you know, no matter what game you're playing, there's going to be a five second latency, right? And that's that can be a problem depending on the type of game you're playing. So these sort of first person shooter games, like Call of Duty or Counter Strike, oh, yeah. gamers just aren't going to put up with that. It's We're, not going to put up with any kind of latency at all. Yeah, um, milliseconds matter in those types of games. Yeah, right. yeah, so, for sure. <clears throat> So, so there's a little bit of a disadvantage on that. But if you're playing like a single player game where you're the only person and it's just a, a campaign level story game or something, the five, you know, the latency doesn't matter as much. Yeah. Yeah. So, it doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter at all. But man, I'm looking at the time here and I want to get to your last one yet, um, okay. which I, we, we've really kind of talked about it and, it and it kind of even just, you know, it can fold back over to the AI piece is the increased legal restrictions to get access to to certain pieces of data right now you know it's pretty lax whereas i haven't i haven't had to serve paper in a long time um so i I don't i'm not sure what major challenges law enforcement specifically but i know it's always been challenged on 
or challenging on the private sector to to get yeah. access to certain pieces of data. But I, what's been your your view on this this year? I know that we. I mean, it's it's interesting because it's like the legal restrictions haven't really changed, but what has changed is sort of what we're seeing an increasing change in perspective on is what data these these vendors are allowed to even store in the first place, right? Hmm. So while the our access to that data through legal means or otherwise may be the same, the type, the amount of data being stored is probably going to decrease over time. Where you have, you know, like the EU and the UK and other governments, even the US are starting to increase privacy regulations on, you know, telling software companies, hey, you can't just store any data that you want. You have to have some kind of framework around what data are you storing? How long are you storing it? What's your retention period? And then depending on the data, there, you could have situations where the government sort of says, hey, you have to store this kind of data for at least this period of time. And then in other cases, the government may say, no, you can't store any of this data, period. Like you're just not allowed to store it, right? So you may have sort of a changing landscape in what data we even are capable of getting from these providers because you know, the regulatory environment may just dictate what the data actually is that they're storing. You know, you could have a future where <laughs> some of these software vendors, you know, a government regulation could come down that says you can store the data, but it has to all be anonymized. It has to be anonymized mm -hmm. tokens where you don't know whose data is whose. It's all just done through an anonymous token that you don't have control over. And what does that mean? That means then, you know, there's no way for the vendor to even know if you request data from I want data from this so-and-so person. It's like they may not even, there could be a future where they don't even know how to get, they have the data, but they don't even know how to give it to you because they don't know how to, you know, they, they've lost the ability to reverse engineer who it's connected to, right? So I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying those are things that could you could see in the future where, um, you know, there could be in encryption standards put in place by, by government regulation. There could be, data storage regulations put in place where it just makes it harder where we have the legal authority to get it but once we try to get it the data could just be in a format or live in a in a way where there's nothing we can do with it um so there's lots of stuff like that i can i can see happening where i haven't i haven't personally heard or seen too many new legal restrictions happening on data sets yet so my original prediction may not necessarily be accurate, but we're seeing a different form of it in, in sort of how data regulation is sort of occurring across the industry. Yeah. And I see some, again, going back to the, the AI piece and data restrictions and data access specifically is, you know, obviously search warrants are supposed to have a specific scope, right? Um, and limitations to what someone's looking for. And I think the if AI advances within that, it's going to have to be aware of that scope. Um, because if law enforcement or government starts looking for something or asking questions, and AI goes off track a little bit, saying that you know this is here, it's out of the scope of the realm of of the original search, then there could be some pretty big issues there um, of whether that can be brought in or not, or at what point they stopped with that. AI is a whole new consideration when it comes to that as well. Yeah, and to be fair, I mean, we, we have that problem in civil litigation already where law enforcement is kind of spoiled in this area where oh, yeah. they, just get, they just get whatever they want as long as yeah. the judge gives the warrant, right? And civil litigation is not like that. Like the, the judge acts as a mediator more or less between the two parties negotiating what data should be shared. Um, so one party doesn't necessarily always have authority over the other on what data they get to see. But what that just means is that we have to go through these complicated processes of, okay, <clears throat> here's how we have decided to share this information. So someone like me or any of the people watching this podcast will have to have a process that they follow to segregate data that can be reviewed from data that can't be reviewed. Right. And the way I look at something like AI, like, yeah, AI, if this AI has been used in that process, it has to have access to all of it, but that's no different than your e-discovery software having access to all of it, right? In some of these e-discovery platforms that exist have AI built into their systems already. Um, it's, just, it's just their own developed internal AI, but 
Um, so I think it, from a law enforcement context, it's one of those things where I've always kind of waited to see when the shoe will, you know, the shoe will drop on that in terms of like how long will law enforcement just kind of have carte blanche over this stuff. Mm-hmm. And when, how long will it take before it starts to merge with how civil litigation works, where there's a lot more, um, the parties negotiate a lot more over what data is, is accessed and viewed. I don't think it'll always be the same as in civil litigation, but I wouldn't be surprised at some point just because of the, the amount of data that can be stored on a computer or a phone where (coughs) we see judges or some kind of regulation around you know, managing the process that law enforcement uses to, to review the data or not necessarily review it, but they might say, look, you can review, look at all the data you want, but the person who reviews it has to be separate from the person investigating. The crime, right. And you right. have to have basically a tank team basically where, yeah, you, you designate a reviewer that can go through all the data and then provide the relevant bits to the investigative team. And then the rest of it doesn't get reviewed and they don't process streams. You know, I could see something like that happening in the future that, it's just a framework to to make make it so that we have a better a better process for reviewing relevant evidence as opposed to just you know having full and complete access to any citizen that you want that you just happen to be investigating you know that sort of thing no for sure for sure and uh with that um man it's after three o'clock already that hour went by quick yeah um so I want to sum up where we're at on our, uh, and again, we'll have to catch up at the end of the year of where we're at on predictions. <laughs> and hopefully before that, obviously, uh, just chat about something else. But um, I, I say it's still yet to be seen. I don't want to say it's a failure yet. I, I, I'll, I'll admit on the G4 side, it's, or G4 now, it's probably a colossal, colossal failure. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay optimistic that there's going to be one person that investigates that. I suspect uh, I, I win may have invested in that company or something. <laughs> I, I used to probably when I wrote the p- prediction, I think I sold right after that. Not too long ago. Okay. Nvidia stock. <laughs> uh, just, just for the AI models alone. That's why I was invested because they were going through the roof and I always get in too late. I hear about something. I'm like, Oh, I'm going to get this. Anyway. It's hard to hear about it. It's too late. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't listen to me. Um, yeah, I guess watch the politicians. They're, they're your best indicator of where they're investing money. That's where they invest in, and you'll be good. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, so Matt, thanks again for hanging out with us. Uh, I really appreciate it. We'll have you on uh, another time. Um, I want to utilize um, thinking about maybe doing a few hubcasts like panels. Um, you know, I yeah. think you'd be great on a panel. Yeah, let's let's and let's get some spicy takes going. I'm good to. I like a good debate and arguments. So I already saw some takes in the chats that I, I didn't say anything about, but I was like, man, <laughs> I'm getting started. No, I'm getting started. <laughs> yeah, lots of fun. That's why I thought panel. Let's get some people on there and uh, and and rocking it. So hey, thanks, Cynthia. I appreciate you, man. Uh, always good to see you inside of uh, of the Hubcast as well. And uh, of course, uh, the regulars that we have in here, Megan's always in here, Amber's in here, um, and there's a few others. Uh, Muhammad, I don't know that I've seen you on the Hubcast before. You, you probably have been. Uh, I'm just I'm scrolling through chat here real quick um, on my side where I can see some of it. Bob's, uh, uh, he's been, actually, Bob's actually been on the show before long ago. Um, some of the things that we're, we're seeing in there. But again, yeah, we're going to argue. Megan says, we're going to argue about console gaming. Yeah. <laughs> I have a console. I have a console. Like, yeah, I, I, Megan's got a PS5 as well. PS5, that's all. That's pretty much my entire gaming experience. That's right? mine too. I have just... PS5. I, I say it's for my kids, but it's my account that's on it. No, you're kidding me. Not the guy that has the Stormtrooper poster on the back. He's no, not, not, not the guy with the, the kids' uh, yeah whole background here, essentially. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Matt. Hey, thanks for hanging out. Don't go anywhere because uh, outro is a little bit different than what we used to have to do before. Uh, so hang out. I'll be right back with you. Everyone else, thank you guys so much for hanging out. Really appreciate it. Uh, and we'll see you guys uh, next week for the next subcast. Take care. We'll see you. Thanks, Matt.